Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation flows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a false ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by Roses. That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased. Even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind 
of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it and instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past so everyone believed that they they were never going to get out of their alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the bad guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties. Let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead. We don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joy joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was a Eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy 
knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. And there we have it, folks. From poisoning themselves to bliss to pure and simple crime, that's Roman parties for you. At number 10, spicy defense. Usually when you think about wars from ancient times, you think of swords, spears, bows, and arrows as being the primary weapons used to fight, but that wasn't entirely the case with the ancient Greeks. It turns out that their warfare was a lot more advanced than you'd think. The ancient Greeks were actually known to have used chemical warfare as part of their defense. They were known to use poison tipped arrows and incendiary weapons. The earliest example of such a thing in ancient Greece comes from the siege of Plataea in 429 BC when Spartan soldiers set fire to a wood pile with sulfur, releasing sulfur dioxide gas into the air and forcing the opposing force to flee their positions. According to other accounts, they may have also poisoned the water supply. The most famous case of chemical warfare from the Greeks, however, comes from the Byzantine Greeks when they invented a petroleum-based substance that couldn't be Distinguished with water and would be fired from tubes that were attached to Greek ships. What's so cool about that is the fact that no one has ever been able to recreate it. At number 9, hashtag roasted. I'm sure you've no doubt heard of the messed up punishment devices that have been used throughout history. I have to say that the people of the past were very creative when it came to coming up with ways to bring harm to others, and the ancient Greeks were no exception. I mean, they certainly weren't the worst when it came to their punishments, but they still were going a little overboard. One of their famously horrific torture devices was called the brazen bull. It was a large hollow casting of a bull made from bronze that had a door installed into the side of it. When someone was up for punishment via the brazen bull, they would be stuffed inside the statue, the door would be closed on them, and a fire would be lit under the bull, heating the metal statue. The person inside would then be sadly roasted alive. I would much rather be roasted on Twitter than inside this mighty metal bull, that's for sure. Before we carry on talking about the messed up things that went on in ancient Greece, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, questionable relationships. The ancient Greeks had some pretty questionable habits when it came to the coming of age of young Greeks. The idea of a relationship between an older person and one who has not yet come of age was not only normal, but was encouraged. As part of the coming of age of young Greek boys, they would be part of a ritualistic kidnapping. Now don't worry, they weren't actually being taken from their beds in the middle of the night. This was more so an agreement made by the boy's father ahead of time, but either way, they would still be taken by an older person from the community, where they would be taken out into the wilderness and taught how to hunt, they would feast, and they would learn how to be an adult. They would later return to the community where they would be given a choice of either severing ties with their adult partner or continuing their relationship with them. It's certainly a little unsettling the fact that this kind of thing was normal. At number 7, backwards logic. It was tough being a woman in ancient Greece. I mean, it's been tough being a woman at any time throughout history and we're still fighting for our place in society on many fronts, but back in the times of ancient Greece, they had it really bad. Part of Greek society included the notion that women were objects and as a result, the Greek saw adultery as a worse crime than non-consensual relations. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, why? And my dear viewer, I will tell you why they had this sort of backwards logic. You see, since women were considered to be objects and property, any kind of misconduct or mistreatment to a woman, especially one's spouse, this was considered to be almost like theft of this object, and so if found guilty, the person responsible for this injustice would be tried for adultery, not the real crime at hand, being the mistreatment of a woman. The punishment for an adulterer was quite severe as when caught, they could risk being killed on the spot and in the event of whatever affair, that would be grounds for an immediate divorce. At number 6, deformed males. Further on the topic of the presence of women in ancient Greek society, let's talk about how women were seen in their communities. Now even though Aristotle was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in history, his ideas were also quite flawed. During his life he believed that women were deformed males who were created when quote, something went wrong in their mother's wombs. Unquote. They considered women to be so terrible that the philosopher Plato also warned men against being reincarnated as a woman in the next life, saying that this could be avoided if they had lots of success during their current lifetime. Because of this view on women, baby girls were often abandoned, girls' education focused primarily on how to have and raise a family, and when girls were married off, they were considered to be property like I mentioned in the previous number. At number 5, democracy? 
Though the Greeks are often credited with the creation of democracy, much like anything else in this world, it has a dark history. One of injustice and bloodshed. Back in the days of ancient Greece and in the relatively early days of democracy, this political practice could sometimes be used for nefarious purposes. One of the best examples of that comes from the Mytilian debate of 427 BC. Basically what happened here is that during the Peloponnesian War, the city state of Mytilene tried to free itself from the influence of Athens. Their revolt ultimately failed and the citizens of the city state were subjected to a severe punishment. They decided to not only execute the prisoners that they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population and women and children were sold into slavery. The vote to put a stop to Mytilene weighed heavily on the minds of those who voted for this outcome, so they later staged another vote, ultimately choosing to only punish those who were directly involved in the city's revolt. At number 4, Crime and Punishment Earlier I mentioned one of the gruesome ways that people were punished in ancient Greece, but let me tell you some more about their ways of crime and punishment. The standard form of executing prisoners was by performing what was called a bloodless crucifixion. Basically, the convicted individual would quote, be fastened to a board by the wrists and ankles and a collar around the neck would be tightened gradually to strangle them to death. End quote. If an execution had to take place on a battlefield, the accused would be beheaded, but if given the option, you could sometimes avoid a violent death by instead choosing to ingest poison on your own terms. If you committed a crime and were able to avoid execution, then you would be exiled. If your crime was bad enough to be banished from your community, then your name and crime would be inscribed somewhere so that no one forgot what you did, meaning that your crime would be known for the rest of time. At number 3, this is Sparta. As you could imagine, childhood during ancient times was certainly no easy cakewalk, but one of the worst upbringings in ancient Greece had to go to the young citizens of Sparta. Just to give you an idea of how life might have been as a Spartan, just think about the fact that it was literally written into law that Spartans had to be quote, fearless, ruthless, and disciplined above all else. End quote. Back then, a young Spartan boy would only grow up with his parents until he was 7 years old, which at this point he would then be sent to a military camp run by the state where he would stay until he turned 30. Young Spartans were taught mostly about fighting, perfecting the art of combat, and would spend very little time learning math and music. These kids were taught to be ruthless, stealing for their survival, and not showing any fear towards their enemies. At number 2, Ostracism. In Athens, back during ancient Greece, ostracism was a common aspect of political life. Back then, the citizens would evaluate the performance of their politicians. They would then vote on who didn't serve them well or who they didn't like, and the citizens would write the name of said person on a piece of broken pottery. The person who gained the most votes from the public would then be exiled from Athens for 10 years. Unfortunately, this was kind of a flawed system, and any clever politician would then be able to use this ostracism vote in order to get rid of their rival. After Athenian figured out the flaw in their system, their ostracism votes were later ended. And finally, at number one, sacrifice. At this point, after learning about so many ancient civilizations, I think it's safe to assume that basically every civilization had their sacrifices. Human sacrifices, I mean. It's been theorized that perhaps the ancient Greeks were participating in such practices because back in 2016, the remains of a teenager were found on Mount Lycaon, which appeared to have been, quote, a product of ritual sacrifice, end quote. It is thought that perhaps this person was meant to serve as a sacrifice to the god Zeus. On top of that, there have also been pieces of ancient literature that depicts the sacrificing individuals in the same area that those remains were found. We don't know for certain if this kind of ritual was part of everyday life or if it was just a one-off type deal. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the 1st century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it. It when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. 
But then it was realized how great a danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number 5, Demand In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number 4, Procurement The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was 
considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape, and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Number 10, three fights and a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave, like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena, where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah. stop. Number eight, 
hates vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors, and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 was a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh, beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Woo! Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return for these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. 
Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now, their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, placed your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was gladiators had a code they had to follow and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade, what a show. Also, this is terrifying. Number 10, population. Here's the thing, folks. When you do the whole sleigh thing, you may need more than one. Maybe two. Okay, 10 tops, no more than that. Okay, maybe like thousands. Yes, this was true of ancient Rome. While it is difficult to calculate the exact number of people who were slaves, some historians speculate that at least 10% of the population were slaves. And if that number doesn't feel right to you, it's because some say it could really be as high as 20%. That's a lot of folks. And honestly, if we're to study history and understand the mistakes of the past, well, having that many slaves means there's probably more people to join in the angry mob and the revolts because you have slaves and people don't like that. Number nine, the act itself. I know I didn't have to tell you this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, the act itself. Now, just an idea, and this is gonna make some corporate overlords faint, but when I say this, maybe we shouldn't put our fellow man in chains and shackles and be forced to complete hard labor for no wage and they're treated like dirt. Just, just an idea, less than dirt, actually, sometimes. Look, I know sometimes we as humans don't get along. As a Canadian, playing hockey in school always changed my behavior. I think Chris would agree with this too. We could be the sweetest students ever, but when we get out of that rink, something changes. You start seeing Stanley Cups and Maple Leafs and probably a forced deal with a very popular coffee shop chain. But all that seething Canadian rage never made me want to treat people the way slaves were treated. What I'm getting at is, even at our worst, we would never do that. 
I wouldn't do that. Chris wouldn't do that. We're not gonna do that. Number eight, work to work. I guess one slightly good thing about being a Roman slave is that, well, if you could even call a good thing in that, really, is that there was a chance to work for your freedom. Literally slaving away in the hot Roman sun for years just so you can get your freedom, so you can work and sweat in the hot Roman sun for years for very little pay. And that's so great when you when I put it that way. I hope there's a sunscreen budget. Some slaves could buy their freedom, some were freed by their masters, and getting freed was actually a big deal as there were sometimes a ceremony where a slave and then a public official would touch the head of the slave of the staff. Abracadabra, alakazam, wishy-washy, sloshy, poof. Magic, you're, you're free now. So simple, right? Almost like it didn't have to happen in the first place. Huh? Number seven, second class citizen. You may have heard this term thrown around a little bit, but becoming a citizen of Rome was kind of a big deal. Your social status kind of defined how you lived. You'd think being a slave, sweating away in the Mediterranean sun wasn't bad enough. There was a lot of red tape to go with this as well. So many rules. When freeing slaves, no more than a hundred at a time could be freed. Okay, but I have a few issues with that. If your house has a hundred slaves, you probably ain't gonna give up a hundred in the first place. Now the rule says under no circumstances can you free a hundred slaves at one time. Okay, what if you break it up? Say you do 50 at a time. What if you do 99 slaves and leave one until later? What if you release one at 11.59 and then the rest at midnight? What if some of the slaves are missing limbs from hard labor and only count as half? Let's say you release 99 and one half slaves at 11.59 and the last half at midnight. You see what I'm saying? There's too many rules. I can't deal with that, man. Too many rules. No. Number six, foundation. Okay, everyone loves Rome. Who doesn't? You got your legions, you got your coliseums, you got your aqueducts. Oh, it's a big deal. As it turns out, the Romans were good at building stuff. Most impressive, honestly, was the roads. I know that's not as cool as the buildings, but trust me, anyone who actually knows architecture in the comments is going to quietly nod their head and agree with me. And so. Yeah, yeah, he's right, actually, yeah. Roman roads last 2,000 years. Toronto is still waiting for the Edmonton Crosstown. That's a local inside joke, but trust me, it'll slap. Where the hell is that thing? Come on. The point I'm getting at is Romans built a lot of great stuff, and it could not have been so without the efforts of the many slaves who built their roads, tended their farms, and did just about everything. Honestly, it's, it was built on the whole thing. Number five, collars. Collars were made for animals, dogs, cattle. No one likes wearing them. Well, maybe except a certain anthropomorphic community, that is. You know what I'm talking about. Sadly though, Roman slaves did wear collars, similar to dog tags in the military. It's a form of identification, and you know that that said person is a slave. Which in case you didn't know, was super uncool. Anyone who says otherwise is just off. Or if I had to take a guess, they're the same people who would choose to side with Caesar's Legion and fall out New Vegas. You know gosh darn well that the NCR is the right choice and or also leading the Las Vegas Strip by yourself. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to be the CEO of three luxurious casinos in the Mojave Wasteland? But I digress. The collars are naughty. They're bad. Don't do that. Especially the explosive ones. Don't, I don't like it. Number four, currency. There's something that just tickles my fancy when thinking about Roman gold coins. Maybe it's my inner historian, or maybe it's because my persona is Wario. Wario likes gold. <laughs> Can't blame me. However, the Roman denarius is not what we're talking about right now. I'm talking about the ancients' other favorite currency, flesh and bone. Unfortunately for the slaves of Rome, they were traded, bought, and sold like an item, or used as a currency. When you build a whole society around such a horrible thing, this just kind of makes sense. It adds up. To make bad things even worse, sometimes when Rome was expanding or the Gauls got a little too close to Rome and some borders were being exchanged, it often meant that some slaves would change hands too. And by that, I mean they were taken and put to work for another boss that was probably less nice to them since they didn't come from the same area. Boy, history sure is mean sometimes. I tell you, that history, oh, oh boy. Number three, the bathhouse. I didn't think this was going to be a secret to anyone, but the slaves weren't just working in the fields or putting up some arches that last longer than most marriages. No, some poor folks had the duty of polishing pearls, smoking the salami, waxing the carrot, and finger fishing for clams. I think you get my point. Yes, the oldest profession in the world, however, it wasn't exactly a profession in this case, more like it, it had to be done or there would be consequences. Eek. For me, brothels might sound great on paper, but when you're laying down in the doctor's office and he's trying to scrape barnacles off your piece of deal, well, I can't say I didn't warn you. Number two, gladiators. 
Guys, I actually learned something today. I know, right? Imagine little old me learning something. Gladiators, you know them, you love them. The movie is okay in my opinion. The warriors who duked it out in the Roman Colosseum weren't always brought in chains. Some were volunteers, actually. Honestly, as I was writing this, I thought to myself, well, gosh darn it there, feller. If that don't sound like that's the Hunger Games. That's right, being dragged away from your family and forced to fight in blood sport. All you're missing is Donald Sutherland's buttery smooth voice. I also can't help myself in mentioning this, but probably the first battle royale ever too. So maybe it's just a part of us. Something about the last man standing that we love so much, and why I want to spend all my savings on Fortnite skins. Number one, thumbs up, very nice. Listen, we've all seen the movie. Joaquin Phoenix is standing there looking all Roman-like and looking into the heart of Russell Crowe, knowing damn well this will probably be his last blockbuster. That's just, sorry, that's just how it goes. There in suspense, the audience waits to see what his thumbs do to decide his fate. Well, this is true of the Roman slaves in the Colosseum, however, there's a couple things that differ from the movie. One, being not all who went into battle perished, and two, the thumbs down might be what you want, actually, not the thumbs up. Meaning that the thumbs up meant, yes, go ahead and finish the plebeian. A thumbs down, a fist, or even waving a cloth might have meant, no, spare the poor soul, have mercy. Number 10, grid-based cities. Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it, there it was. Number nine, arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more to that on later, you'll see, you'll see. Number eight, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think that's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try it. Well, we'll see. Best of both worlds. Well, it's true. The Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's a, little, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once? Well, I don't have to tell you how bad that was. Especially, you know, public washrooms, you know they can be bad. Especially with open stalls, that just can't, mm. Ah, no good. Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating puddles every time he breaks. The roads consisted of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. 
I've got some Daenerys for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains in the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury. One that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't want to give the Romans too much credit but Gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from 1 to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're going to need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Whoa, I don't think, uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that, nope. I'll be in drama class, much easier. I'm not going to math class, I'm going to drama class, No. Nope. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know, I was surprised too, I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus and yet again Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out, we're gonna break, we're gonna break some stuff down here, ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for 8, 9, and 10, right? Just like October, November, and December are the 8th, 9th, and 10th months out of the year. That makes sense. Big prank though. Uh, I got you. Nice try. Because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. But it's crazy what you can do with a little power. It's crazy. So now October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12. They got pushed back. See, it's crazy. You ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it. It makes. I just. I, there's some people like. I actually didn't know that. I opened up your mind, brother. That's what I do. That's what I do here. Number three. The Empire Business. I'm in the Empire Business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside, also, good show, watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. It takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, to the capital moving east and the empire being split to east and west, and then those Byzantine guys showed up, and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans. It, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. 
Like, it like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you could use it again. It's no like it's it's insane. It's just where did we go wrong? Number one, entertainment, show business. <laughs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Coliseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Coliseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's what'll tell you what counts, the theatrics. Number 10, a 10 hut. The Roman army, baby. It's rough, it's tough. And worst of all to their enemies, they were organized. But something every Roman soldier had to go through was some intense training. The training lasted four months, that's too long, started with intense marching and eventually moved into sparring. By the time they were finished, they were able to march 20 miles in full armor. A paid military rank and highly effective, the Romans were a formidable fighting force and an inspiration to many, including some ideas that are used in modern militaries today. While not having a perfect win to loss ratio, the Romans are probably most remembered for their military prowess, techniques, and weaponry. They got some cool spears. The theme, or really their best tactics, was teamwork. Roman legions worked as one. It would make them a very worthy opponent for many opponents. Number nine, lonely Romans. I don't know about you guys, but after conquering lands and marching for days, I would be tired. As much as the Romans hated barbarians, some of them were tough and cost the Romans many lives in battle. So it would be best for the Romans to fight their hardest in order to come home to their families. Well, that wasn't exactly the case for Romans as they were not allowed to be married. Not until the second century that was. All that unaliving and conquering and no one to come for you from all those horrors of war. I would need a hug for sure. However, like a lot of rules, they were meant to be broken as some higher ranking Romans in the military did take some wives. And honestly, can you blame them? Number eight, short straw. Roman soldiers were professionals, maybe too professional. In the time of the Romans, there was the occasional deserter or mutiny. However, the Romans had a simple solution for this, or rather a pretty wild one. Something called decimation, or the removal of tents. Basically, after an offense has been committed, you and nine buddies line up to draw straws. Whoever draws the shortest straw gets unalived by your remaining nine friends, often by stoning, clubbing, or stabbing. That's just, that's just great. This punishment was not just limited to grunts, but open to any rank and anyone who dared disobey the Roman military code. Cause they're Romans and that's just how the Romans do. Forget about it. I spoke to the legionnaire of my army today, who just so happens to be the chief. You know what he said? That's not it. Number seven, the Battle of Cannae. This was a hard day for many Romans. Maybe it was its overzealous confidence from conquering so much after losing so little. However, after facing the mighty elephant riding Hannibal of Carthage, the Romans were about to get a piece of their own medicine. Over 40,000 Romans would meet their ends in the Battle of Cannae. I can only imagine the confusion and humiliation the Romans must have felt. The battle is considered to be one of the worst days in Roman military history. It's also considered to be one of the greatest strategic military victories in history. From the bad guys, or the Carthage at least. I mean, they beat the Romans in the one thing they are really good at. That's like me trying to beat Michael Phelps in a swimming race and then me winning. Yeah, never gonna happen. Which I'm sure if I did would shock absolutely everybody, including myself. I'm not built for swimming, I'm built for sinking. That's just how it goes. Number six, the Battle of Carthage. It wouldn't be a good story without a little revenge, would it? The Third Punic War was the last time Rome and Carthage would engage in combat. Rome began the siege of Carthage, and it was a brutal fight. Carthage did everything they could to repel the Romans, but Rome was powerful and was ready for their sweet revenge. Eventually, the city could no longer repel the Roman attack and was captured. The city was completely destroyed, and those who survived the siege were taken by the Romans and sold off into YouTube's least favorite S-word. The Romans had fought hard against Carthage and were probably glad to be rid of Hannibal and his war elephants. Yes, that's right, war elephants. He, he trained elephants to kill people. Like, that isn't so insane that you could train an elephant. Number five, civil unrest. Imagine you're a farmer, poor, hungry, and tired from tending fields all day long. Or you're a merchant in a city who's doing their best to get by. 
When you hear the thunderous marching of Roman soldiers approaching your position, the Romans are here to Romanify you. Or something like, there's no verb for that, I guess, I don't know. There's a good chance if you don't accept the Romans at your front door with open arms, they would force you to anyway. This means a lot of Roman soldiers dealt with civil unrest at home and abroad. And sometimes people just didn't want to be Roman. Kind of makes sense. Kind of a broad point too, but this is just how it goes when you conquer that much. The Roman Empire was one of the largest the world would ever see. Eventually, she would fall, due to many factors, but the civil unrest was always there. At least we still got the Colosseum though, right? Pretty cool. Number 4. Wizards of the Barbarians The spookiest enemy of the Romans, no doubt, was the Druids. Religious-like figures who aided the barbaric hordes in many different ways. Romans did not like them, and they wanted them gone. You could almost say they wanted to purge them. Like a certain hooded Sith that purged the galaxy of those treacherous Jedi. Execute Order 66. Unfortunately for the Druids, they got a bad rap, as almost everything we know about them is written by Romans, who were their enemies, and they weren't exactly that nice when speaking about them. So were they actually magical ritual practicing wizards? Maybe, but always remember that history is written by the victors. A lot of Romans are great because they told us they were. However, for the average Roman soldier at the time, any amount of propaganda about weird wizard people it was probably believed, as there's no trusted reliable sources of information back then, like Wikipedia to fact check, because they always have facts. Number 3. Barbarians Barbarians are basically what all Romans called, well, basically non-Romans. Uncivilized, brutal peoples living outside of Rome in the lands that Romans so wanted to conquer. More specifically though, the Goths from Gaul. In what is now modern day France, many times the Romans would find themselves engaging with the people of Gaul. Conquest and assimilation is the name of the game. And like the other tribes and cultures in proximity to the Romans, they weren't exactly going to take it sitting down. Eventually the tides would turn in their favor, and every Roman soldier's worst nightmare would come true. Rome was sacked by Gaul in 390 BCE. The horrors. Number 2. Attila the Hun Probably the most ruthless enemy the Roman Empire ever faced. Every once in a while someone rises in the ranks in history and becomes a well known conqueror. He ranks up there with the other big bad boys. Going against the Hun was to be a formidable foe. He conquered many lands before taking aim at the Roman Empire. I can just imagine the dread on the Roman soldiers faces when they realized who they were going to be toe to toe with. However, in the end the Romans would claim victory and Attila was defeated and perished during his attempted conquest. Number 1. Being a soldier I mean let's be honest, through everything I've said the Roman army was made up of soldiers. Sure it may have been a very long time ago but it's, it's still the army. And I don't know how you guys feel about it but I am certainly not brave enough to be in the army. All my respect and love goes out to any soldier in the armed forces, thank you for your service, seriously. But being in a modern army may be tough, but imagine being in the Roman army. I mean you gotta walk everywhere or, or sail everywhere and you better hope the enemy is close because otherwise you're gonna be walking or sailing for a long time. And as a tubby boy with asthma, I would not fare well in the hot Mediterranean sun. With excessive walking and a diet of wine and bread, trying to swing a sword while bloated must have been the biggest challenge yet. No thanks. I'll pass. Kicking off the list at number 10, party hard. The term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary in 2002, but Romans were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They knew how to get down, well rather they knew how to get it up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves puke in order to continue eating and drinking. How gross is that? What would normally be a red flag at a house party was actually a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties, these long exhausting banquets, attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, and grossly enough puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town apparently. It was so normal that you would excuse yourself from dinner and be like, mm -hmm, excuse me, go to the vomitorium, great name, right across from the dining room. I'm sure it's a great breeze rolling through there. But then you'd go in this room, grab a feather, and then tickle uh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. What a treat. Birthday parties were never so disgusting. Number nine, gladiator blood. 
When Charlie Sheen started talking about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like he was insane, rightfully so, but back then if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, well, you were on the right track. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape. With all that long hair as well, I don't blame them. So the thought process here, being extremely superstitious, was that if you drank gladiator blood, whatever disease you had, it would soon be cured. So these Roman physicians would tell their patients with epilepsy to chug some warrior blood, like you're a vampire. Apparently it works, like some of the time. Never really, not really. I wouldn't recommend this, don't do this. Number eight, you're in trouble. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we talked briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Hmm, lovely. Fresh breath guaranteed. Well, to dive deeper into this gross fact, Romans also used urine to wash their clothes. So after they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with fragrant leaves. They would use bay leaves and just rub it all over themselves, which is interesting. They didn't use soap because the amount of ammonia used in urine, well, it did the trick. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the Folones, the ancient laundromat, where everybody would just catch up and stomp on their, you know, urine-filled clothes. Again, the smell is probably not that pleasant. Number seven, Roman art. If you've seen Superbad recently, this next one will ring a bell. I grew up watching Art Attack, okay? The British dude, Neil Butchanin, with his aggressive sidekick head that would just yell at you all day. What a fun way to learn how to draw. Well, back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art with a similar eggplant theme. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, people. Genitals carved everywhere. Carved, I said. Not just like, you know, drawn in Sharpie. Carved in the streets. Carved in the walls. Just under a street sign, you'll see one of these. Just popping out at you. Hello. Just generations of genitals. Rich history, folks. The phalluses of Pompeii. Imagine tripping over one of these. You do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. Imagine looking back and seeing that in the ground. I'd be like, okay, we're just gonna keep walking. Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel, when in reality, these were actually just for good luck. They didn't really have a purpose other than good fortune. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folk kept these outside their front homes. You know, right next to the mailbox. That's great, it's a good, good spot to put it. Number six, new hair, new me. Glowing up these days is quite easy. Change your hair color up, throw on some jorts, listen to Adele's new album, Bob's Your Uncle. It works, it always works. But if you were an ancient Roman and you want to show off the new you to your ex, maybe at the vomitorium party, how would you change your hair? How would you do it? Well, it was common, but the way they used to get it done was all but. Romans would have to use goat fat and beechwood ashes to bring out those highlights. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline. Again, like those crazy parties, this was a symbol of status. If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, who even are you? Get out of here. Emperor Claudius III, his wife Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and then painted her entire body gold and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. I feel like this would have been a really good reality TV show back in the day. Number five, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out. Those 1 a.m. selfies never looked or felt so good. Ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was quite common, but they didn't have any neon lights or quotes and selfies. It was just a lot of bricks. Oh, and also, it smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra less is more lifestyle. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, of course, they also had to share. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal. You would spend hours here and you got done, literally. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, all the while a dude's in the corner just like going to the bathroom. Romans believed the goddess Cloquina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Cloca Maxima translates to big drain. I guess when you invent the flushing toilet, you can call them whatever you want. Just don't call any meetings there, perhaps. Might be a good start. Number four, no soap. Sometimes you're in a rush, it happens. You don't have time to shower, so you do the classic spray yourself with cologne and then hope that you fool the world. It's a smart move, but the ancient Romans were way ahead of you. While they didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent, it's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies. Instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz, but later on, once that oil had dried up, it was then removed with a wooden wedge or a spatula-like tool called a strigle. The world's most painful loofah, sign me up. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently just peeled off. So it did work, but it took a little more time than our usual showers nowadays, our you know five minute rushes before work. 
For Romans who were well off, this was a whole event. There were several assistants you could pick from all these fancy and fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. How was anybody ever on time back then? Number three, all the poison. There's always the one kid who's allergic to nuts on your flight. And it's horrible, now nobody gets nuts on this flight. It's tragic, really. Research shows that feeding infants peanuts or peanut products when they're around four to six months old can prevent a peanut allergy. But Roman emperors had their own way of achieving immunity. It was common for Roman kings to seek out and then consume a small amount of each known poison because they thought at the end of this grueling trial, you would become immune to them all. It was a hot blend called Mithridium, named of course after the poison's creator, Mithridates the Great. He lived until he was 80, so maybe these potions that he created might have actually worked. The world's first vaccine, perhaps. Number two, thumbs up or thumbs down. Giving somebody a thumbs up after they've done something, it feels nice. You're like, yeah. Even a sarcastic thumbs up, use those when you get cut off in traffic. In the hit film Gladiator, there's a scene where Joaquin Phoenix's character gives Russell Crowe's character a thumbs up, and in turn, he lives, and then we watch cinematic redemption. In real life, ancient Romans used these thumb signs to determine a gladiator's fate in the Colosseum. It was referred to as policy verso. It's the Latin term for a turned thumb. The crowd would vote if a gladiator should die or not, which is also insane. It's like America's Got Talent, but like insane. While it's nice to receive a thumbs up after doing something today, if you got a thumbs up or even a thumbs down, it meant your days of living have come to an end. And finally, number one, animals in the arena. In order to spice up the classic fight and clashing swords till death action, sometimes gladiators would be put into the arena with an animal instead of another human being. Were they squirrels, maybe an opossum, or were they tigers or elephants, bears, lions, leopards, hyenas, wolves? Oh my God, they didn't win these often, did they? Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used all the time, but the organizers of the battle would go all out for the fights if they did include them. Like Logan Paul versus Mayweather, it's a big social event. Most animals who were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part as well. I'm a big animal lover. So much so that I'm rooting for the elephants in these fights while reading up about this. This led to another important factor down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals started taking place. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile and made them extinct. Now cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct. Well, number 10 in our countdown, you were probably property. Gladiators were war prisoners, arrested criminals, or slaves of wealthy upperclassmen who had been sold in Rome's lucrative slave market. When the Monera gladiator battles first began, it was only slaves or criminals fighting against one another for a full year. No one actually died in gladiator battles under the law of Emperor Nero. However, we know from media that that didn't last, and gladiator battles became a widespread and gory form of entertainment. However, a common misconception is that gladiators always fought to the death. In reality, as time went on and the Monera games became a lot more controlled, of a spectacle that raked in a lot of cash, the wealthy cultivated gladiators and trained them. They invested in them, so it would be an economic blow to have their warriors die. So gladiator games, while bloody, had more of the intent to maim rather than downright slaughter. However, you always did as you were told, so sometimes the hand was forced. At a time when three in every five persons did not survive until their 20th birthday, the odds of a professional gladiator being killed even accidentally during the first century AD was perhaps one in 10. With this evolution and growing celebrity of gladiators came free men volunteering to be gladiators. They signed on for a fee and swore a fearful oath of absolute submission to the Lentista to be burned, flogged, beaten, or killed if so ordered. In fact, it was estimated that more than 20% of the trainee gladiators who attended the Ludi Gladiatori, or gladiator school, were free men from Roman society and also composed most of the gladiator population by the end of the Roman Republic. But no matter how idolized a gladiator became in Roman society, he never rose above the social status of a prostitute. Number nine in our countdown is the contradictory sexualization. Gladiators had their names painted on street walls, monuments erected, and even properties built in their names and images. So isn't it a little strange that despite all of this, the second a gladiator was out of the ring, Roman people would look down upon him? Well, since they were usually criminals or slaves, this was the case. The term gladiator was even used derogatorily at the time. That didn't stop their wealthy masters from taking advantage of the endless lust directed towards the men. Gladiators had such an effect on women that the first term for fangirl was invented in this time. Graffiti was found on the walls of Pompeii, even note how one gladiator was the delight of all the girls, while another catches the girls 
that night in his net. The whole industry was built around sexual attractiveness of gladiators, and gladiator merchandise was popular as a result, especially amongst Roman women. For example, flakes of gladiator skin, bottles of their sweat, and ornaments colored with their blood were sold as aphrodisiacs, contraceptives, and love potions. Men, however, sought out the fighter's blood because it was believed to increase a man's sexual vigor. Speaking of blood, could you use a little to your own advantage? Before you think about it, you can't fake death. Comes in at number eight. It'd probably be pretty tempting when faced with clubs, roaring lions, flaming arrows, and swinging swords. You get hit hard enough, and a messy gash with enough blood can make your prone body look lifeless if you lay still enough. But don't be fooled. When they drag your body out from the arena and your heart skips a beat thinking you got away easy, you've done anything but. The Romans had measures to make sure that the dead were truly dead and not faking it. After a gladiator faced his honorable death and was carried through the death gate, he was taken to a room where he was stripped of his armor before they cut his throat. Nothing to worry about if you were dead, but if any part of you was still alive, it would be bleeding out. When a less than honorable gladiator was declared dead, a slave would instead come out and bash his head in with either a large rock or a club publicly. Either way, there was no way for a gladiator to escape death after he had fallen. The Romans loved their irony, and what better example than deaths at a funeral? Number 7 in our countdown. How did these bloody displays even begin? Well, they were originally part of the funeral entertainment and blood rites for wealthy nobles. When distinguished aristocrats died, their families would have two slaves or criminals throw down in a kind of macabre eulogy to honor the virtues the deceased had had. Okay. Two Roman writers, Tertullian and Festus, give us some insight as to why this may be. Romans believed fresh human blood helped purify the decease of sin. Under the reign of Julius Caesar, these games flourished. He threw a hundred man spectacles in honor of his deceased daughter and father, and by the end of the first century BC, government officials began hosting state funded games as a way of currying favor with the masses. One notable exhibition took place in 216 BCE when 22 fights were held over three days to mark the death of a prominent senator. In gladiator school, these men are taught strategy, technique, stamina, and how to die, which is number six in our countdown. It was in the ludus that the gladiators learned the rules of the arena. Above all that they were taught was that they were entertainers first and killers second. But all gladiators were instructed to accept the will of their editor, the efficient. So if the editor decreed that the gladiator be killed, they were expected to accept this by kneeling and showing their throat to their opponent to be cut. Despite their status and social standing, gladiators were expected to be noble and honorable in death. If you did indeed die well, then you would be treated with extra dignity. Your body would be removed from the arena with respect, as we discussed in number eight. So what makes a gladiator death inhonorable? First, the gladiator would have had to cry out during the fight, which is considered a sign of weakness. Should a gladiator be losing and ask for mercy from the editor and be denied, he was considered a coward who had failed to commit his life to the games. And so what do you feed a mighty warrior? Well, seeing as he was also your property, you want to get your bang for your buck. Number five is the warrior diet. When the remains of 67 gladiators predicted to be over 2,000 years old were researched, modern day science allowed for a reconstruction of what these mighty men were eating. It was discovered that they ate a plant-based carb rich diet that included barley and beans, but very little animal protein. Essentially, they were vegetarians. For how hard these men were worked and trained, this diet was not meant to be filling. More pragmatic reasons, as simple carbs can boost subcutaneous fat and increase survival in battle. Because of this fatty cushioning, the blood vessels and nerves were better protected when they were cut in fights, as blood clot significantly faster. Another reason for this diet was that it was cheap when you had a lot of mouths to feed. Oftentimes, food was already something gladiators had held over their heads as a motivational drive. Gladiators also consumed some more other questionable things, such as each other's blood or uh, drinking cupfuls of water mixed with ash as the perfect remedy for abdominal cramps and bruises. I guess if they're hangry, they're going to be more efficient in the arena. Gladiators weren't the only hungry animals in the arena, however. Number four in our countdown is Battle of Beast. Animals were seen in the arena for the purpose of killing or being killed. It said around a million animals died in a sport called Venatio over the 390 years that the Roman amphitheater was active. Venatio was hunting and killing of wild animals and would often take place in the morning ahead of a gladiator's battle that would be happening in the afternoon. Animals used in the games were considered to be extremely exotic at the time as a display of wealth of the empire. Some of these examples are deer, rabbits, crocodiles, and elephants, and then the better known examples of leopards, bears, tigers, boars, and lions. While the goal of Venatio was for the animals to be the victim of the trained gladiator referred to as a venator, sometimes they simply overpowered their opponent and won in the arena. In which case, like a gladiator, the crowd would celebrate the 
animal's glory. Animals were also used in ad bestias, a form of execution for lower class. A prisoner or multiple would be let loose in the arena with wild animals for the crowd's delight. Sometimes traps or weapons were laid out to draw out the spectacle. Even after Emperor Constantine outlawed gladiatorial fights in the year 325, gory animal entertainment continued for another 300 years. Don't be misguided, however, the Romans knew how to have a bloodbath just about anywhere, so Rock the Boat is number three in our countdown. Called Nachia, this event was a naval battle staged by the emperors using real ships in large Roman channels or even artificial lakes. Considered the most spectacular of blood sport, this wasn't like regular gladiatory battles taking place regularly. This was reserved for high honors or special occasions. The Roman Colosseum is known to have held two near the date of its inauguration. One Nachia took place in the commemoration of Julius Caesar's triumph in 46 BC. No surprise, as Julius was actually the inventor of this blood sport. Participants were low status gladiators, prisoners of war, or criminals condemned to death, rather than any appreciated gladiators, as the battles were much bloodier and fatality being the goal made death inescapable. And that's not what the gladiators were about, so it was said as many as 2,000 prisoners would be boarded onto the ships to fight amongst each other while the civilians watched from a safe distance. And boy, did civilians come. People came from all all around to see, and it's recorded that some were trampled to death in the process. Others camped out overnight in order to get a seat, like it was an Ed Sheeran concert. Like festivals or fireworks, a mini industry would set up around the lake or amphitheater. Bars, street vendors, and prostitutes would come into the area in order to capitalize on these events. Unlike a letter from Hogwarts, this is not the type of school you're excited to attend. Number two is Gladiator School. You only got into this school one of two ways slave purchase or volunteering, which by the way would be insane, as Gladiator schools were incredibly strong and the training they provided was harsh, with some archaeological evidence showing that gladiators could be killed as punishment for just misbehaviors. This is because upon entering gladiator school, those who had not been condemned to it as a punishment for a crime sign a contract stipulating the type of combatant that they would become, how many times a year they would fight, and sign themselves over into the property of their master. Seeing as there was different kinds of gladiators, men were sorted into categories based on height and body, where they would train under a madristi, or a gladiator gladiator trainer, who were former gladiators themselves and would pass on the skills they learned in the arena to the new generation of fighters. As we know, food was sparse and purely fueled, the rest of the environment reflects that ideal, with gladiators living in cells and only leaving them to train or battle. If there were any luxuries in gladiators training schools, they were only there to protect the slave owners investments in their gladiators. Archaeologists have found many schools equipped with heated floors and reliable hot water, as well as infirmaries and graveyards. After the rebellion of Spartacus and his fellow gladiators, around 73 BC, these schools were no longer privately owned, and the state took a much closer interest in how they were run, ensuring that gladiators they trained wouldn't use their specialist fighting skills against Rome itself again. Finally, at number one in our countdown, the break for freedom. You've been kept in a dirty cell, forced to battle and train on repeat, fed mushy barley, something's gotta give. How do you get out? We know you can't exactly fake your death. Well, unfortunately, unless he performed exceptionally well in the arena, a gladiator was unlikely to be made a free man after just one glory. Glory. It's reported that most gladiators needed to fight and win about 15 times before seeing freedom from slavery. Since a sole gladiator fought an average of three to six times a year, this was a long time. And since one fifth of all fights ended in one of the combatants dying, the odds of making it to freedom were pretty low. However, some gladiators had no interest in leaving. One example is celebrated fighter Flama, who rejected his offered freedom on four separate occasions. He carried on and in total fought an amazing 34 times, winning 21 of his contests and drawing in nine of them before dying in an arena in Sicily. One of Rome's most famous gladiator battles documented was a tiebreaker. Priscus and Versus were two of the best gladiators of the first century, so obviously they had him face off. A poet named Marshall documented both men being a perfect match of skill and bravery, fighting for hours until ironically submitting to one another at the same time. The crowd exploded at the scene and shocked Emperor Titus declared that they had both won and gave them the ultimate prize. Freedom, symbolized by a rudis, a wooden sword that both men would have used when they started their gladiator training. These examples were lucky and skilled men, however, as most gladiators did not ever survive to see freedom, especially those who earned their career as a punishment for being a criminal. All right, I want to start small and warm us up, so let's meet the turncoat Arminius. Unbeknownst to the Romans, their one time barbarian ally, the Germanic chieftain, had a change of heart on the 9th of September, 9 CE, and decided it would be kind of silly and fun, you know 
to lure 36,000 Roman soldiers to their death. The deadly ambush was set up in the Titoburg forest where the friend of Arminius, Publius Varius, was leading the troops. When they were pounced upon, as many as 20,000 Roman troops are cut down in the carnage. Varius was horrified by the betrayal. He had just defended this man to the Roman courts only weeks prior due to suspicions of a coup being somewhere in the kingdom. Now he saw the consequences of his actions and it was the chopped up mincemeat that was once his army. So Varius threw himself on his sword. This was a bad time for Emperor Augustus already so this is notoriously the story of him getting told the news and it making him bang his head repeatedly into a marble column while crying to Varius' dead ghost to give him back his legions. Dude was in his 70s and running the Roman Empire was stressful no doubt. Tiptoeing up the escalation stairs, we'll do Marcus Menlius next. Hear that? Manly is in the literal middle name. Now I know it's his last name, but just let me have that, okay? So this is the second known case of Berdulio, Berdulio, Perdulio, a type of top-notch extremist level bat betrayal charge, and it was a good old Marcus that was slapped with that title. Manlius was a celebrity as of like 390 or 387 BCE since he defended the Capitoline Hill against a band of Celts that had annihilated a Roman army and captured the city itself. A few years later, he became the champion of the common people because he was anti-debt and anti-debt bonded, which would definitely make the notables hate him, especially the Roman establishment. Manlius is seen as a threat and subsequently accused of aspiring a regnum. One of the traditions mentioned by Livius, he was condemned by the Dumviri and thrown from the Tarpinian Rock. This was a fat spit in the face to the former hero, seeing as the Tarpinian Rock is part of the Capitoline Hill, which Manlius had defended so courageously for the same twist of being tossed off of it. There's a lot of cool names on this list, but I'd say this one is pretty up there. It's Furious Prosimius. According to Pliny the Elder, in ancient times, jealousy, bitterness, and disbelief towards other people were at 100% visibility if they achieved even bare minimum success. Gaius Furious Criminius, a farmer from Italy, is a literal court documented case of this. He was just a really good at gardening and farming, just a total green thumb type, and he worked hard and he was organized. He had well-groomed animals and servants and was able to achieve really large crops, which the neighbors were jealous of, especially because he just moved in and they had the head start. How was he doing this? Well, if you got a small brain and no logic, you're gonna assume witchcraft. His neighbors gaggle together and sue him for magically poisoning their crops during the night. The Roman magistracy is then prosecuting him under the provision in the law of the 12 tables, which punished by death or the loss of citizenship if anyone is convicted of using magic to take away the fertility of someone else's soil. It is the only known trial where this law played a role. On the day of court, Criminius cruised in the city before the Karul Adil and peeved neighbors, loaded down with his farming tools in excellent condition and healthy, content, well-fed animals and servants. Since he was visibly just harder working, he just won. Like that, and his neighbors learned something about the grass will always be greener on the other side. Let's meet the multi-charged Messalina, because she is the first recorded woman in the Julio-Claudian period of Rome to have multiple criminal charges, because if we're being real, women usually get executed on their first criminal charge, so makes sense she's one of the only. Emperor Claudius' third wife, she had a keen understanding of power politics, and her means of exercising power in politics circles was through criminal law, and not even a little, like by 600 in 89, she even had her own regular prosecutor, P. Silius Rufus, whose services she was widely known to have employed, aka Messalina's a Karen. And she's a true historical reminder why no matter how great a man Claudius was, especially in law and leadership, he had one weak spot. Absolutely bat crap crazy women who would train wreck or bang just about anything. So let's run through some of Messalina's track record, shall we? So Messalina versus Julia Livilia in AD 41. Political accusations under the motive of Messalina's jealousy that secured the banishment and subsequent death of her husband's niece, Julia, all because she didn't pay honor to Messalina or flatter her, and she was extremely beautiful. A year later, Messalina versus Appius Silanus, who is her literal stepdad, and it ends in his death. Why? Because she threw herself at him, and he rejected her advances, so she told a soldier to tell Claudius that the soldier had a dream Silanus would kill Claudius. Dreams come true, so Claudius had Silanus smoke. Year after that, it's versus Canonius Justice, because the prefect had witnessed Messalina Selena forcing moral degradation by making women commit adultery in the imperial palace while husbands were present, an act of humiliation and shame for all victims involved. Prefect Catatonius was going to snitch to the emperor about his wife's wild hobbies, but before he could, she had him 
charged with an undocumented crime that had him put to death. Honestly, I could keep going with Messalina, she's got quite the rap sheet, but we got bigger and better to move on to. Like next up is the rescue of Sextus. The Roman names, man, they really go hard. So, Sextus Roscius was a farmer in 80 BC. His dad was killed in the streets of Rome, no witnesses. When Sextus is boohooing, almost the second his daddy o is killed, their family estates were illegally added to the year past submission end dates for the prescription auctions by Lucius Cornelius Chrysogothenus, powerful freedom men of the dictator Sulla, the same man who buys the estates worth millions for meager pennies from the auction. That's right y'all, we got an ancient Roman scammer. So Lucius then conspired with two relatives of the deceased named Titus and Titus, no not a joke, to accuse the young Sextus of his father's murder. The case was so simple for the prosecution as obviously Sextus had the most to gain from his father's death and hired someone to do the deed. Meanwhile the Roman courtroom bad boy Caesario picks up Sextus's defense and turned the whole trial around in his first ever major litigation by simply explaining the exact series of events I explained to you. Conspiracy, auction, scam, etc. Caesario argued that those who chose to align themselves with Lucius in the belief that they were supporting the nobility were wrong to do so. Since his corruption was a stain on the Republic, his defense was a swinging success and Sextus the Young is acquitted and his land returned. I hope you're curious because the next is Trial of Curious. In 63 BCE, a trial took place in ancient Rome, which is still shrouded in mystery, even in its own time. And it serves as a reminder why the statute of limitations is in place, because Romans really charged a dude for a 37 year old crime and Perdilio, aka the super duper high treason. Saturnius works with Gaius Marius a lot. His support helps Marius in winning seven consulships and securing land for veterans. Things go south though when Saturnius and another friend, Glaucia, are implied for two political slayings and put out a bill saying the lands they owned would re be redistributed to the poor. When have rich people ever liked that news? So he put in the bill, if you fight against that, you lose your royal status. When representatives of the Senate came to Marius asking for his help, Marius, even in Plutarch's version, actually feigned a bad case of diarrhea to avoid having to deal with this. In the end, Saturnus and Glaucia are overpowered, forced to surrender and stoned to death. Marius sadly has to abandon his buddy and moves on in his life for 37 years. One of the instigators against Marius can be identified with certainty. His name was Titus, again, and he must have been in his mid 30s during the trial but wasn't born when the stoning even went down. But he knew his uncle was one of the victims and felt that was a pretty good way to get some fame and cash. They could have gone after a bunch of other options but Marius, someone who was friends with the victim and weirdly he was their unspecified choice. He was charged with complicity, which he obviously denied, but where the hell was he gonna find witnesses? 37 years later when most people died in this time at like 20. Thus the insane charge of high treason as well as the killings. Caesario, who acted as his defense had done what he could but he was no match for the bratty nepotism of Roman hierarchy. So Marius was crucified. Speak with your chest baby girl, it's Masia of Sentinum. There's lots of notable women lost to history thanks to sexism but some remain on the blurred line. We know little about her, her native city is an ancient Ubrian town and her vague description is dark hair. The only Latin author author that wrote of her is Valerius Maximus and it's in his memorable deeds and sayings text. He paid more attention to the action done by this woman because it isn't in compliance with the social and cultural values of ancient Rome. Masseria is one of those women who, as Valerius writes, were restrained from speaking in the forum and in the courts either by their sex or by the chastity of matronly dress. The men of Masseria's family were involved in the Great Umbrian Revolt of 90. For this reason they couldn't defend her in court when she was put there in charges. We're not really sure what those charges are. According to the rules of all of ancient Rome, Masseria should of being able to defend herself and she was a victim of circumstances, thus she was allowed to be able to. Valerius Maximus writes that because she had been accused, Masseria of Sentinum defended her own cause before a great crowd at the court convened practor Lucius Titus and having used all the techniques and devices of defense not only accurately but also courageously, she was acquitted at the first hearing and almost unanimously. So because she was concealed by a manly spirit in the guise of a woman, they call her androgynous. Nice. Love a poet, but their content is too happy for you? Consider banishment. Worked like a charm in the case of Ovid's exile. In December of 2017, similar to the writer and poet Dante, Rome's council unanimously approved a motion to repair the serious wrong suffered by Ovid, thought as one of the three canonical poets of Latin literature, by finally ending his exile. So, why exiled? Well, we have three factors at play. Ovid's sensual poetry was considered offensive, his attitude to the Emperor Augustus was too disrespectful, and he may have been involved in an unspecified 
unspecified plot or scandal. He was friends with a bunch of the members of the failed coup against Augustus in 6 AD. So it was believed he knew it was gonna happen but didn't tell anyone, aka conspiracy. Rumors were also implied that he helped Julia in her many affairs, which scandalized Roman society and pissed off her hubby. And Ovid may have had an affair with the emperor's granddaughter. All we know is that in 8 AD, Ovid is booted out of Rome on personal orders of Augustus without due process. It was a big ol' scandal in the empire, but who's gonna say anything? We could go to Ovid for answers on what happened, but exile was brutal for him, he had to leave his wife and kids, so all he'd ever say, it was the result of a verse and a mistake. When Augustus died, the Pope and his family had real hopes under the order of banishment that it would be lifted. Unfortunately, the successor, Tiberius, was a cruel man and continued to forbid the poet's return. He died of unknown reasons in 17 or 18 AD. Imagine seeing Triple on the battlefield and it's not because he got conked on the head. The Hoteius trial. It starts with two sets of triplets and two warring kings. Alba Longa has invaded some Roman territory and the armies of Tullus meet them there where the armies then discuss how to minimize the bloodshed. Only to notice that both sides happen to have brought sets of triplets to the front. It seems divinely sent, and divinely sent that the gods had this strange coincidence occur, so it was agreed that the two sets of three would be the only battlers. The Roman brothers Horatius and the Alban brothers Coratius duke it out to win and end the war. After two of his brothers are slayed, the final Roman triplet uses a clever strategy to strike down his opponents and win. The armies go separate ways, and Horatius is rejoiced by his people, but not his sister Horatia, who is devastated to learn her fiance, one of those three triplets from the Albans has been killed. Horatia's great grief angers her brother, after all, they were enemies and they were responsible for the death of her other brothers. He drew his sword and approached his sister saying get lost and some other stuff, I'm not kidding, and swung his sword through her. Record scratch sound effect, everyone went from cheering to what the hell dude and dragged him before the emperor, who appointed a people's assembly. Assembly's conclusion is what he did was effed in the head and they can't acquit it. While the executioner's binding him up, daddy Horatius pulls up and makes an appeal. He thinks his daughter being killed was justifiable, gee thanks dad, and secondly he just lost three out of four kids in one day, I know this is messed up, but this is all I've got left. So they acquitted his son on the admiration for his courage rather than upholding law and justice. And last but definitely not least is the very well known trial of Jesus. The only issue is, is the bible is being so edited and rewritten and redistributed there are too many different versions of the story to really nail down any real ones. So here is what we know in layman's terms, Passover, Jesus and his disciples, actually his name is Jesus, are in Bethany for the occasion. The first three gospels say Jesus first stop was at the temple complex where he flips some merchant tables in front of it for selling stuff in a place of prayer like it's a Walmart. Valid. According to the general understanding, first proposed by Mark, this event leads directly to the condemnation and death of Jesus. In these first three gospels, Jesus and his disciples have cedar and after dinner they go over on foot to the Mount of Olives where the famous prayer to God is known to be agony. Since Jesus foresees what is to come and he gets zero response, where's dad when you need him? The next day, boom, a mob of Roman auxiliaries snatch Jesus up as Judas betrays him with a smooch. Jesus seals his execution when he responds to the high priest question in court, are you the blessed one, the Messiah? To which Jesus goes, heck yeah dude, I'm the son of come in glory when God's kingdom is established to judge all humanity. Evidently the high priest was hoping Jesus was smart enough not to admit to a literal jury, but alas, the high priest has to declare this a crime of blasphemy and condemns Jesus for inciting Roman rebellion. There are other contributing factors outside of angry or Roman leaders. Gospel, he's charged for not telling the Jews to pay taxes to Rome. In John's gospel, condemned because of the growing crowds over his raising of Lazarus. In all four gospels, Pilat is, is portrayed as reluctant to execute Jesus. He attempts to avoid the decision by offering to release another prisoner, Barabbas, and through a sop over the now anti mob by letting them decide. No matter, the crowd's cries, give us Barabbas, and Jesus is condemned to death for rebellion against Rome, who then crucify him. Number 10. Sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations, okay? They invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies of the Bible. 
Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now these books were ignored at first, but upon its second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the Temple of Jupiter. So if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. Number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar, when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crossus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened happening at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city. Cause guys are dumb asses. That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruin the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. Number seven, sewer goddess. I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in eight minutes flat with him. The god of toilets. There's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome, all this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, AKA Big Drain. Eventually this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains, nice. That's a lie actually. As a kid, I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I'd pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't wanna get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff, it's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So, it's a lose-lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one, the loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step on how to make your own loincloth, and I tried it, and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and you know, zippers and stuff, but that's that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're building a castle, anyone watching? Like say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here or else 
Let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period, that's it. Or else, this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor, the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet. And then again, the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool. That's like the worst way to drown too. I'd say chamber pots were safer, but when it comes to waste, out of sight, out of mind. Sadly, just get that shit away from me. Just downhill. Get it out, or else we'll drown in it, probably. Number three, Roman shampoo. Okay, when my hair grew out over the pandemic, I had a panic attack. I've never, I don't know what the f to do. I had a huge wake up call. I've never had long hair before. I don't know what to use in this mop. I still don't, clearly, evidently. All I had growing up was the classic four in one shampoo for guys. That wasn't working out at all, that sucked. I needed some curl cream, okay, separate jars of items, not just a five in one with mouthwash on your head. That's, those aren't, those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses also, very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran, before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> Be so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift, and let me tell you, last year, I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm? That's it, I don't want a PlayStation, get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks, they weren't Vans skateboarding socks, they weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the eighth century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the second century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Which is kind of ironic, because socks have holes in them. You get the joke, there it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today. A little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together, a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts, it was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I of course mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools, Great, I gotta send an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. Kicking off the list at number 10, gladiator blood. Okay, nice and thirsty this morning, so let's talk about gladiator blood so we can get nice and hydrated for this video. When Charlie Sheen started talking smack about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like this guy was insane. But back then, back in ancient Roman days, if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, that's great, you were on the right track. Something's, something's working for you, pal. Keep it up. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape and they looked like lions with their glorious hair. I'm attracted to Romans, uh, most of them. So the thought process here being extremely superstitious was that if you drank said gladiator blood, whatever disease you had would soon be cured. Yes, the strong heart of a lion, blood. Yeah, if you have some epilepsy, uh, Roman physicians would tell you to drink some blood, like you're a vampire. Yeah, here you go. Here you go, Edward, enjoy, hope you feel better. Number nine, you're in trouble. 
Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we mentioned briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Yeah, fresh breath, not guaranteed, actually, this time at all. It's really not, it's the opposite, in fact. Well, to dive deeper into this gross, disgusting fact, ancient Romans also used urine to wash their clothes, yep. That's so gross. I was like, I hope, I hope no one peeing on them. There we go. After they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with uh, leaves. Yeah, they would use bay leaves. Yeah, they didn't use soap because, well, the amount of ammonia in urine did the trick, so there was no need at that point. Yeah. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the, you know, washrooms, the old ancient laundromat. Same thing, really. They're pretty close. And then everybody would catch up while, you know, stomping and urinating and cleaning out their clothes. It was, it was a good time. Number eight, new hair, new me. As soon as I cut my hair, I'm not gonna lie, I felt great. There's less weight on the neck, I could be more free in my silly movements when I do these lists. Glowing up these days is easier than ever. You know, the tutorials on YouTube as well, you can learn how to do your brows while hearing true crime. It's amazing what we have nowadays. The Romans, not that easy. They had to do a little more work back then. If you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe you're at a vomitorium party and you, and you see your ex maybe perhaps, how would you dye your hair? How would you get their attention? How do you show Romulus that blondes do in fact do it better, right? Romans would have to use goat fat and beech wood ashes to bring out those highlights, yeah. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline, maybe it's disgusting. It's definitely disgusting. Again, like those crazy Roman parties, this was a symbol of status, right? If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, um, who are you? <laughs> You're not on the list, honey. Goat fat or bust, I don't speak broke. See ya. Emperor Claudius, his third wife, Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and painted her entire body gold, and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. Yeah, Bachelor in Paradise, Pompeii edition. Tune in, it's night at eight. Number seven, party hard. The term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary back in 2002, pretty recent. But Romans, they were doing that a long time ago. They were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They were ahead of the game. They knew how to get down. All those ancient parties, well, rather, they knew how to get it back up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves throw up in order to continue eating and drinking because it was a social status. Yeah, what would normally be a red flag at a house party was a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties were literally business meetings. These long, exhausting banquets. Attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most. You wanted to dance the most. And you wanted to ideally puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town, right? <coughs> you ever see a Roman gagging? You know, he's, he's getting some stuff done in the city. Ah, oh, he's like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh. The solution back then was to throw it up and then continue. So you can, you know, excuse yourself from dinner, go to the vomitorium, right across from the dining room. How convenient, must be a nice breeze rolling through there, I'm sure. But then you would go to this room, grab a feather, and then tickle oh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. Yeah, they have a thing that holds uh, feathers. So you just go in and go, oh, a blue one. And then you shove it down your mouth, and then put it back in. After you dry it off first, you gotta put it back in. Number six, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out, okay? Those 1 a.m. selfies have to look good. That's the whole point, or else why are we going out? Why am I putting on shoes, right? The curls aren't working, I'm not going outside, that's it. In ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was common. They didn't have any neon lights or anything cool. They didn't have Arctic monkeys playing or any cool atmospheres. It was just a lot of bricks. And also, it of course smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra Less Is More lifestyle either. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, they also, same with the feathers, they had to share said sticks. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal, it was business. You know, you would spend hours here and you got stuff done. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, you name it. All the while, there's a dude in the corner just taking a <laughs> Romans believed the goddess Glochina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Glocha Maxima translates to big drain. So when you invent the flushing toilet, yeah, you're obviously, you're like, this is some higher power. You can call your toilets whatever you want, you know? Just maybe don't call any more meetings there because it uh, smells a little bad. Number five, no soap. Look, sometimes you're in a rush, you don't have time to shower, so you do the classic Axe Body Spray X, you know? The old one, two. Do you remember that, Chris? Oh, yeah. It was yeah. so cold, too, on the armpits. Wow. Yeah, like, you know, no wonder I can't grow armpit hair. I've been spraying, like, aerosol. I've been spraying spray paint on my armpits every morning since I was, like, nine. 
I still use it sometimes. Axe chocolate, no contest, so good. Ancient Romans, they were way ahead of the game. They didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent like I mentioned earlier. It's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies, no. Instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz. But later on, once said oil had dried up, they then removed it with a wooden wedge or a spatula, a tool called a striggle, and they just peel it off. I kind of like that idea. Whenever I burn in the summer, I'm like, ooh, let me peel this neck slowly. It's the world's most painful loofah, essentially. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently peeled off. So it worked, but it took a little more time than our showers nowadays. For Romans who were well off, this of course was a whole event. There were several, you know, assistants. You could pick all these fancy fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. It was like fun, dare I say. How is anybody ever on time? Like, oh, sorry I was late. You know, those, those oil baths. I had to stick around for four hours this morning and get peeled. It's crazy. Number four, Roman art. This one reminds me of Superbad a lot, and you'll understand why. Back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art, all with a similar theme. A similar, everything looked like a certain body part. An eggplant-ish theme. There were carvings in the streets, there were carvings of these things in the walls, under a street sign, you name it. They're just everywhere. Just rich history carved in all over. We're still finding these uh, today. They're called the Phalluses of Pompeii. Yeah, imagine tripping over one of these. Then you do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. You look back and see that. You're like, oh, what? Some dude in Pompeii got you like thousands of years ago. Just chiseling out a... Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel when in reality, that's a lie. These were all just for good luck. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folks kept these outside the front of their homes, right next to the mailbox. <laughs> Coming with mail, you're like. Number three, animals in the Colosseum. In order to spice up the classic fight and clash swords till someone's not alive anymore, sometimes gladiators would be put in the arena with an animal instead of another human being to, you know, spice it up, just to spice up those Saturday night shows, I guess. People are crazy. Were they squirrels? Or were they tigers, elephants, bears, leopards, lions, hyenas, or wolves? The latter, it was all the scary big animals. Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used every day, but the organizers of these battles would go all out for the fights that did include them. Everyone would pile in. It's kinda like Logan Paul versus Mayweather, you know, these big social events where like, well, what else are we doing, you know? Let's go watch. Most animals that were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part. I'm a big animal lover, so that's hard to read. This led to other important factors down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals took place. That's where it all started. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile, for example, and then made them extinct. That's how they did that. Cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct more and more. You know what, let's just bring gladiators back. Let's just do it. UFC, put them in armor. Let's see what happens. That'd be hilarious. Release all the animals from zoos and then bring back just gladiators. Life, life will be fixed. Number two, naval battles. Have you ever heard about staged naval battles in the Colosseum? It's a weird spectacle, but it wouldn't have been that crazy. It sounds a lot bigger and more lavish than it really was. The Colosseum was flooded at this point, which I'm sure took a hot minute, and then these ships would come out, and then it would be like medieval times almost, but with a splash zone, a really dirty splash zone. These ships were designed to resemble vessels from famous battles before, but the bottom of the ship was flat, right? These were fake boats, obviously. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use you know, real ships or anything like that. It was all show. It wasn't always violent reenactments either though, as funny as that sounds when you think of the Roman Colosseum. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and have nude, synchronized swimmers as a show. Imagine that, imagine traveling the land and then you get there, you're like, oh, let's watch some action. And it's just like ballet. And they're like, oh, this is actually quite nice. I like this a lot. Yeah, also goggles weren't invented until the 14th century. So they had to swim underwater like, oh, this is so gross. Their poor eyes. These naval stories were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them now. Like the Goblet of Fire, people would walk to a lake to watch these insane shows. Only once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the Colosseum's old floodgates to hide those animals in. So it was, you know, we love upgrades, I guess. It sucks, it all, it, it's all bad. And finally, number one, audience troubles. Okay, what's it like watching these ancient Colosseum shows? Was it fun? Was it horrifying to watch? Were you? Like, the, the PTSD from these shows alone. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat would pour in often. The energy is high. This was their only entertainment. They were watching The Witcher season three, you know what I mean? Some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle, like we do nowadays with like UFC. 
people would be watching like, oh, throw the right hook, throw this thing. They would obviously do the same. But in Roman Colosseum days, you didn't get a warning if you heckled, you know what I mean? One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, I mentioned earlier, he was pretty uh, diehard about the Colosseum and their games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd was heckling a gladiator so much, he was probably, you know, talking smack about his oiled up abs or something like that. So Emperor Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena. And then he had to fight to survive. He didn't get out alive, obviously. It was all bad. So yeah, don't huckle. Don't huckle? Don't huckle or heckle. Don't huckle or heckle or heckle. How terrifying is that? Can you imagine heckling and then getting called out? Agent Coliseum times. Hey Maximus, smile. Me? Number 10, Decim Viri, the law of 12 tables. Well, actually the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the Law of 12 Tables. A commission of 10 men, or also known as the Decemviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place, holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mayhu, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kind of got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kind of sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers, didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them stone cold Steve Austining the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey. You got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Guess I could just like make a wall. And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. Number seven. Daily acts. In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as daily acts at this point, or acta diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it. These were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? Ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. It took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Julius Caesar. 
Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the First Triumvirate. Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red, moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis. Political differences. Yeah. Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Ah, fairly well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. Number 5. Basket of Bees. Guess what this one is? It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the Dark Ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows? I don't know, history gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, eh, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? Number four, the Colosseum. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know. That's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge. It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a 10th lays discovered with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic, 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kinda. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and... Also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tums to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before tums. See, what you would do is you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go <clears throat> and put it back and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster, because hey, now you made room. Number two. Gladiators. If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then yeah, absolutely nailed it, because that's pretty well it. 
A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the Gladiator Games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, okay, you're Spartacus. Spar okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the gladiator, though living just to their mid-20s. I mean, it was, it's pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy, which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from eight to 10 fights in their whole career. Come on, dude, 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of like Spartacus, just. Yeah, that's nice, I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time, until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once thriving city of Pompeii. We found the snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time, it was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? Number 10, Roman laundry detergent. So my washing machine broke this past week, which was a pain in the neck. Worst thing about it was that it broke in the middle of a load, so I had to wash the rest by hand, which made me glad we have washing machines at all. However, the Romans were a little more simplistic with their methods of cleansing the cloth. Apparently, Vessels were set out in the streets of Rome for anyone to just walk up to and relieve themselves into. And once full, they'd be taken down to the local laundromat. From there, workers would mix the vats with water and pour the combo onto their patrons' clothes, proceeding to stamp the clothes until clean. Yeah, sure, clean. Number nine, the fall of Drusus. In the case of historical poisonings, it's hard to determine whether or not they were actually poisoned or just died from being old. It's usually that they're old. But in the case of Drusus, the evidence was a little bit more clear. See, Drusus Julius Caesar was set to be the heir to Tiberius due to familial relations. His buddy Sejanus would have normally been the one to get the title, but blood is thicker than water. As as a result, Sejanus tried to marry his daughter to Drusus' son, but that fell through. Sejanus was still determined to become the heir to Tiberius by whatever means necessary. This led to the two infighting frequently, and Sejanus eventually managed to seduce Drusus' wife, Lavilla, who aided him in poisoning her husband, slowly killing him in a way that appeared to be natural. And he got away with it. Sejanus continued to rise to power until until his sudden and brutal execution, which was later revealed to be due to someone leaking the truth about his rise to Tiberius. Man, this just needs to be a telenovela. Number eight, decimation. You've likely heard the term before used to describe the impact of some tragedy or another. However, the word actually has its roots in the Roman military, though its origin is a little different from how you might imagine. See, as I'm sure you know, the Roman military was infamous for its discipline and strategy. But if you've ever worked in any space with more than 10 people, you know it's 
hard to keep everyone in line. So how did the Romans do it? Simple. If one squad member screws up, the entire unit gets the punishment. Decimation roughly translates to removal of a tenth. The cohort would be divvied up into ten groups, and each group would draw lots. The group with the shortest straws were then executed by the other nine by whatever method was determined by their commander. The nine of the surviving groups were then made to survive off barley, and if they had to relieve themselves, it would be outside of the camp's security. You know what? Maybe the military life just ain't for me. Number seven, the Crassus cocktail. Ah, I love a good drink at the end of the day. Just getting a little mix here and there, it's just so fun. Ooh, it's good? Man. Just caps off a hard day of work. It seems like Crassus was a man of similar taste. A general and a statesman who'd earned the title the richest man in Rome. Dude ran a bunch of wars, serious campaigns, and his last was against the Parthians. Primarily because he was just kind of bent out of shape that the other generals were outshining him in the field. Unfortunately, Crassus's forces were absolutely slaughtered, and when his his son Publius ended up being one of the casualties of war, Crassus went to parley. Negotiations went sour, and he and his entire party were wiped out. Apparently, after such a rough day, the Parthians figured that Crassus could use a little something to take the edge off, so they had him take a sip of molten gold. Fun fact, the uh, melting point of gold is about 1064 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that'll have a kick. Number 6. The Fall of Emperor Valerian One of the later emperors of Rome, Valerian rose to power simply and ruled simply. Went to war a few times, killed a bunch of Christians, got beat up by Goths, basic Roman stuff. So when Valerian was captured by Cameo of Shapur I, it boggles the mind why they went as far as they did in making sure that this dude wasn't just defeated, they made sure his entire genetic code wouldn't survive the humiliation he received. First on the menu was for the Shapur to use him as as a footstool while mounting their horses. He was then given the Crassus Special, a big old bowl of molten gold right down the gullet, which may or may not have happened while he was simultaneously being alive. His skin was then allegedly stuffed with straw and died, hung in the Persian temple for all to see. Seriously, the dude just didn't like Christians. Chill. Number 5. Gaius Valerius Catullus Rap Battle Who doesn't love a good beef? Now, Catullus was a major poet. His works moving away from the retelling of classic tales and focusing more on the telling of day-to-day -day life. The personal nature of his works have lived in the minds of thousands, depicting humor, romance, and the beauty of day-to-day -day life. However, Catullus was no stranger to critics, two of his biggest being another poet, Furious, and Senator Aurelius. Now, constructive critique can be wonderful for artists. After all, it's the only way that you can improve. However, Catullus seemed to take a different view, writing a poem in dedication to his critics. Commonly referred to as Catullus 16, this poem was so filthy that it wasn't fully translated until the 20th century, and even then, several lines were heavily censored in most publications. Wanna hear it? Well, it reads… Number 4. Roman Birth Control Romans were… Well, they got around a lot. Now, unless you want to deal with the immediate consequences of a whole lot of lovin', you have gotta figure out a way to stay safe. Picking up condoms from a shopper's wasn't really a thing, and Plan B hadn't been invented yet, so what was the plan? Well, it turned out that the Romans had discovered an herb called silphium, which supposedly had contraceptive properties. Whether or not that's actually true remains to be seen, specifically due to the fact that you can't find it anymore. That's right, the Romans were so raunchy and Silphium was so popular that they caused the complete extinction of the plant, the last stock of it reportedly being given to Emperor Nero. Now, in 2020, there has been a theory presented that there is a similar herb or a relative found in Turkey, and it could be the surviving relative of the plant, but to this day, not a sprig of silphium has been found. Apparently, it looks like a heart, though. Aww, ecological devastation. Number three, Roman baths. 
The terms made its way around. Roman baths are synonymous with the country and culture as a symbol of civilization. But you've listened to enough of this list so far, so you can probably figure out where this is going. See, while Romans were known for their hygiene, urine laundry aside, uh, they were usually pretty nasty when it came to bath time. Soap wasn't really a thing, so the baths were basically just huge vats of oil that they just slather up all in there. Now these oils were perfumed, but they were also reused used frequently and were washed off using a strigil, a sort of scraping tool, so you know, just spoon the dirt off. Ugh. Number two, Cato the Younger. All right. Here's a fun one. Marcus Porcius Cato, also known as Cato the Younger, was a Roman senator in the later years of Rome. A hugely influential man. His life was fraught with turmoil and strife. He was also a strong opposer of Julius Caesar's Hellenistic principles. Uh, Cato had no trouble joining the opposition on the brewing civil war. Now, during that civil war, Cato took command of a campaign in Utica. A tough campaign that he generally just planned to abandon alongside the Roman Empire. However, one once they'd been defeated, Caesar moved to pardon Cato's family and allies. Convinced his end was drawing near, Cato took his life against his friends and family's advice, stabbing himself in the abdomen. Now, some accounts claim that he actually drew out his own entrails from his body when the physicians attempted to heal him, ensuring that he wouldn't see Caesar's Rome. And maybe he knew that Caesar was planning to pardon him as well, which Cato would have considered the crueler punishment. Number one. Caligula's horse. Ah, uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about the antics of Emperor Caligula. Famed for his strange ways, one of the greatest legends of an already infamous emperor was his attempt to have his favored horse, Incitatus, enlisted as a consul. According to Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, this horse was dressed in lush finery, inviting dignitaries to dinners, and according to Cassius Dio, the horse was fed oats mixed with gold flour lakes and also possibly a priest. Uh, now a lot of this is left up to debate, and a number of historians will argue that this was nothing more than a prank at the expense of the senate. While never officially made a consul, this horse has lived on in infamy, inspiring a number of fictional depictions in modern media, including the metal band Caligula's Horse. Regardless of the official status of the horse, the truth seems to be that this was nothing more than an attempt to mock his senators, but what a a method of mockery. Number 10! We're making a video about mysteries from ancient Rome, and you think I'm not gonna talk about Pompey's own villa of mysteries? <laughs> you balkin, mate, you balkin! The villa of mysteries was discovered back in 1909 after being buried at Pompeii. One of the more mysterious finds was a wall fresco that depicts what could be a play or wedding, or maybe an initiation ceremony to an ancient Roman cult known as the Cult of Dionysus. We don't really know anything about what this cult actually did. They were obviously very good at keeping things under wraps. What happens in the cult stays in the cult. Or however that saying goes, I don't really remember. No one was allowed to know what happened in their initiation, rituals, or really anything. I mean, they weren't even allowed to write it down. But if that was the case, why was someone allowed to paint it on a wall? Make it make sense, bro. Make it make sense. Number nine, family traits. I think this one is kind of really interesting. There is a village in Western China where the people who all live here, meaning their families are all historically from here, have blue eyes and blonde hair. While not exactly uncommon, I guess, the sheer amount of people specifically from here that have these particular traits that are different from the black hair and dark eye color of most people in China suggest that everyone who is native to this area may actually be descended from an ancient Roman legion. I have the blood of a legionnaire flowing through these veins! That'd be so cool. In 53 BC, Marcus Crassus lost pretty badly in a fight in what is modern day Afghanistan. It's believed that the Roman soldiers that survived traveled as mercenaries, just trying to make a few bucks, and they apparently wandered as far as this village in western China. DNA tests on the villagers of this area actually do show that they are 50% Caucasian, which is super interesting, but we don't know for sure if it was these traveling for sale legionnaires that were the cause. And maybe I'm just a silly goose, but I don't even know how we would be able to find that out with some kind of archaeological evidence. Number 8. Misleading. In 2010, we discovered a coffin in the city of Gabi. A coffin made of lead. 
It was also, interestingly enough, in the shape of a burrito, giving it the nickname Lead Burrito. You won't be seeing me going into Chipotle to ask for that one. Yes, I'll take one Lead Burrito extra deceased Roman inside, please and thank you. No. The University of Michigan, the ones who led the expedition that found the coffin, said that lead coffins like this are extremely rare. But on top of that, this one specifically is incredibly heavy, like 1,000 pounds, letting us know exactly how expensive it must have been. The mysterious part comes to play when we realize we have um, absolutely no clue whatsoever who the adult man inside this coffin is. We know he was around at the time of Nero, but there is no evidence inside this burrito about the life this man lived. No extra toppings in this burrito, just lead and meat. Yum. Number seven, the Ninth Legion. In ancient Rome, there was a legion that was known to be the best of the best the Romans had to offer. It was known as the Ninth Legion. Being the best of the best came with being put into the harshest of harshest of areas to fix Rome's problems. So these boys in red were sent to England, past Hadrian's Wall, where they would fight against the Picts. But then, they were just never heard from again, ever. Now, the obvious answer here is that they got absolutely demolished by the Picts. The last thing we heard was from the year 108, and we know that the Legion had a pretty brutal surprise attack in Caledonia due to some Roman guards falling asleep on the job, which um, doesn't really seem like best of the best behavior now, does it? What makes this whole thing really weird is that in 121, there are some bricks that have the seal of the 9th Legion on them, which is about 13 years after their last mention. And on top of that, there is an officer from that legion who shows up as the governor of Arabia in 142. I think these could have just been survivors who were taken out of England after the best of the best went bust. But who knows? Not me. Number six, La Custa the Poisoner. Nero, 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 you little rascal, you. Emperor Nero was known as one of the worst of the worst, and he was also known for having a few people, um, be lifed. What better way to do that than with poison? The chemist Lacosta was the one who became his poison expert, but she's also kind of unfairly known as the world's first serial delifer because of that. Kind of unfairly because it could be completely true. We just have no idea. We know from historians at the time that Nero and even his mother liked Lacosta so much that he actually helped set her up with a school dedicated to creating new poisons and all kinds of research surrounding poison. But we don't actually have any of that research. There is no proof of any of it. But she was executed by the guy who took on Nero's job after he was gone, and I can't help but think there is a decent reason for that. Maybe because of all the people she poisoned and helped poison? We will never know. Probably. I mean, we could. I don't know. Number five. Play that liar to the fire. While we're talking about Nero, he actually has a mystery all of his own. Nero was very famously a fan of music. He would often sing and play instruments. And he was also a fan of being utterly insane. Ending lives and forcing people to party all night, have massive parties, and eat until they puked. So when you hear a rumor that this crazy emperor may have caused the Great Fire of Rome that destroyed a lot of the city on July 18th in the year 64, you might believe it. And you might even believe the rumor that he also played the liar while the city burned. It just kind of all checks out for how crazy he is, but obviously we have no evidence of that actually happening. Neither of those two rumors can be proven, especially not now, 1,958 years later. What we do know is that the Emperor did benefit quite a bit from the destruction the fire caused. It allowed him to change the aesthetics of the city, persecute thousands of Christians, and introduce new building codes. But it also turns out Nero may have been 35 miles away in Antium, but I mean, prove it! You can't. I, I can't. Number 4. Ham Hill. Ham Hill in England is the location of an archaeological dig by the universities of Cambridge and Cardiff, where we made the crazy discovery of the graves of a lot of people, dating back to the time in history when Romans made their way into England. The part that is so alarming, other than finding a pile of corpses, is that these particular bodies had been stripped of their um, exterior layers and chopped up. It's gruesome. But oddly, most of the skeletons found here actually belonged to women, and most of which were women in their early 20s. But this wouldn't be a mystery if those were all the facts. We actually don't know what happened here. 
The obvious answer is some kind of mass life ending escapade, but why, damn it, why? We don't know. I don't know. Number three, hard talker. Surprise, you've met the afterlife. Were you a good person? Well, if you weren't, if you were a threat to your community, say in ancient Rome, then it's pretty likely you would have been buried face down. So there, take that. Hold up, they cut out your tongue and put a stone in your mouth? What in the Gaius Octavius Caesarian, what is going on here? That's probably what the team who unearthed the grave of a man from a Northamptonshire site dating back to Roman Britain probably said. They found a man who was buried face down in his grave, missing his tongue with a stone in its place. Pretty odd. Infection in the bones of his jaw show it was removed while he was still alive. And the practice of replacing a missing body part with another object was definitely known to happen in Roman Britain, although it was rather rare. The only thing is we have absolutely no idea what this man had done. Maybe he just really talked too much. Maybe he lost his tongue to something completely unrelated to his delifing, and this stone was just to replace it. We don't actually know, and there is no evidence to tell us. Theories? Number two, Skulls of London. I'm not really sure how this happens, how it was discovered or anything, but in 1988, 39 skulls were excavated really close to the Museum of London in London. Those 39 skulls were alarming enough, but the 39 soon expanded into hundreds of skulls. Now, possible theories included that the skulls belonged to executed criminals, gladiators, or even soldiers that had done the Monty Python, you know, run away! Most of the skulls seemed to have been from men, and most indicated that they suffered rather brutal offings. Some people think the skulls were dumped in display pits. Some people think they were placed there purposely. To make matters worse, not too far away, we also discovered what seems to be an ancient Roman cooking pot with bits of humans in it. All of this creepy stuff was found in an area no bigger than a swimming pool, which makes it very obvious that it was all a part of the same thing. Possibly part of some crazy Roman cult. Maybe it's all just a big coincidence. We don't have the evidence to know. I don't think I could really tell you exactly what in the name of Mark Anthony went on here, but I do know that it were not good. Number one. Mole warfare. Who would have thought chemical warfare would make for a great story? Especially 2,000 year old ancient chemical warfare. Back in the Roman city of Dura Europis in Syria, a siege took place between the Roman and the Persian forces. During said battle, the Persians dug siege tunnels underneath the walls of the Roman city. The Romans knew and built their own tunnels to cut them off. The problem with tunnels like that is you have absolutely no idea of where exactly the opposing team is going to show up. The Romans ended up building their tunnel higher than the Persians did, so you got like a like this kind of situation going on. Now, archaeological digs have discovered about 19 Roman soldiers in these tunnels. But it seems that these soldiers were not stabbed to cause their demise, but instead, they seem to have suffocated. Well, how the heck did that happen? According to archaeologist Simon James, he believes that the Persians actually allowed the Romans to dig into their tunnel, and then use the elevated position with a sort of chimney effect to set a mix of bitumen and sulfur on fire and let the fumes do the deed. But, and say it with me, there is absolutely no evidence of this. Yes, good, good, you, you, you've caught on. Very nice. Number 10, stuffed dormice. This list is gonna be kinda tough even for a meat eater like me. Dormice are small rodent animals found in the old world like Europe and Africa and Asia. The old world, you get it. But just as common as your American house mouse. As it turns out, they were a favorite of Roman cuisine. Oh God, the horror. Sometimes they were even fattened up for a better meal. The recipe goes as follows, cause I just know the folks at home are salivating at the mouth wanting to try this. Get your farm fresh dormouse, empty its cavity, and stuff it with an assortment of other meats and spices. Oh, beautiful, magnifique, and sometimes dipped in honey. Like stuffed jalapenos, except they're from hell. Mice are also known for not being the cleanest animals on earth, so I, I'm gonna hard pass on this one, brother. No thanks. Number nine, sea urchins. Uh, until today, I had never seen what the inside of a sea urchin looked like. I never did. That's when our most handsome boy Adam said, let me show you. Weird creatures, or at least to my North American palate they are. Very strange looking. Plus, when they were opening those bad boys up, it just looked like it was too much effort for a little bit of orange looking meat. Strange. Well, Romans being geographically located in the Mediterranean Sea found themselves around a lot of these bad boys and started to crack them open. I saw a technique with two spoons, but uh, 
Well, I feel like a couple good bashes from a Roman sword ought to do the trick. All the things in this list, this is probably the least gross. Although, I gotta say, you see a spiky thing in the water like that, and, and the first guy was like, we should eat this. Uh, it's so weird, why would you do this? It doesn't look edible. Number eight, flamingo tongue. Excuse me, I said, looking very cute at the computer researching this topic. Curb your tongue, internet, I said. I do not believe you. Alas, as cute and as blue and innocent as my eyes are, it was true. Romans were eating flamingo tongues. Ugh. Flamingos were associated with luxury, wealth, I mean, they are a strange color and it's close to purple, Romans love purple, and compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, it, it just doesn't really fit in, so yeah, sure, it makes sense. Well, the opulence in Rome loved flamingos and their tongues. My only hope is that they used all the birds. In my research, it said that poor citizens did when given the opportunity, but I just can't see the wealthy chopping tongues and that's it. Hors d'oeuvres, anyone? Number seven, garum. All right, if you're like me, you're a meat and potatoes kind of guy. When I was growing up, and I probably will be until I'm 80 in a senior home, that's just the way I am. Now, that being said, you can't have hockey pucks on the barbecue without her best friend, her luscious red lover, Heinz number 57 ketchup. Am I right, Chris? Oh, of course. Exactly. And yes, mom, I can tell the difference. Thank you very much. Well, meet the Roman ketchup that would be included at a lot of meals. Almost all of them, apparently. Garum. You take fish blood and fish guts and you pack a whole bunch of salt into it and stir it up until it looked like the forbidden tomato paste. You spread that bad boy out on a wooden plank, let it dry out in the sun for a week, and uh, bada bing, bada boom, baby, you're in Rome. You got yourself an apparent delicious condiment for every meal. Apparently it was at a lot of meals, which is... Can't imagine that being very good. Salted fish guts, oof. Number six, ostrich. I like chicken just as much as the next guy. Matter of fact, maybe I like it more than the next guy. Any chef will tell you a fresh and properly prepared chicken goes a long way. You can make soup, stew, pasta, fried chicken, baked barbecue, roasted chicken, casserole, chicken burgers. I mean, she's flexible. You can do a lot of stuff and she's just so versatile. Now, the question is, is ostrich as flexible? I doubt it. They were an exotic bird even back then and apparently one emperor liked to shoot their heads with arrows for fun. That was part of the fun and games, yay. <laughs> okay, sometimes I can't believe the stuff I read. I'd say this is probably the second least grossest thing on the list, but I don't even know where to get ostrich. And honestly, to even try, I feel like a weirdo Googling that. Where do I get ostrich meat? I don't know, that just doesn't feel right. Number five, lamb brains. Ooh, gross. Okay, lambs are not my favorite, but it's not that bad. I can see why people like it. The right preparation would yield a delicious and nutritious meal. Especially like roast it over a fire or something. I hear lamb's pretty good that way. I never had it that way, but I hear it's good. Lamb's brains, however, uh, I don't know, man. Remember that scene from Hannibal where Anthony Hopkins cuts open the skull from the guy from Goodfellas and you get to see inside his brain and how a good fella thinks? A mafia joke. Oh look, there's the prefrontal cortex. Look at all those memories of beatings and extortion. Oh wow. All jokes aside, it's a gross scene. And I can't help but not forget about it when thinking of lamb brains. Well, the Romans, they loved them. Romans enjoyed lamb brains in a variety of ways from cured, boiled, Baked, oh, and more. One of Pickiest recipe even calls for lamb brain, eggs, pepper, and rose petals. So you never have too many rose petals. Number four, sow's womb. It's exactly how it sounds. I know, it's just another part of the animal, but some pieces, well, they just don't taste like the other do. They, they kind of taste worst. And when there's no yieldy Taco Bell, your options get stretched thinner than a contortionist who's out of a job and working street corners. So it makes sense to use all the parts of the animal, which I certainly hope they are. I certainly wouldn't want any to go to waste. While not as common as other dishes on this list, you would find the sow's wound prepared with various spices and oftentimes a mixture of vinegar and honey. I don't know if those go together. I don't know if that, that's, and I think sow is, I believe is pig by the way too, sorry, I forgot to mention that, pig or a hog or something like that, sorry. Number three, giraffe. I mean, okay, such peaceful animals are just all necks. Is neck even that good to eat? I don't know. Has anyone ever had giraffe before? I, I don't know. Another animal considered to be very exotic for the time, even back then, sometimes they would even find their way into the arena to fight themselves or other animals like lions. Kinda crazy. If you've ever seen a giraffe fight before, you know how brutal they can be. It's basically who can whip their neck back and forth 
the hardest and the fastest. Scientists uncovering artifacts from an ancient restaurant in Pompeii found remains of a giraffe leg, so it actually may be more common than we think it was. Number two, jellyfish. Let's go in word. There's only two things I know about jellyfish. One, in SpongeBob, jellyfish produce a most delicious jelly, hence the name, and that goes on a Krabby Patty. Remember that episode? It's one of my favorites. Two, jellyfish got some nasty stingers, some of which can prove to be lethal, and no amount of Bear Grylls knowledge in urine can save you. He pees on them. I, I saw him do it once, and now I always remember that if I get I to pee on it. But apparently, that's not how you do it. Anyway, jellyfish were most likely not eaten every day on everyone's diet. However, there are mentions of it in some Roman writings. Picasus cookbook is the best collection of ancient Roman recipes to ever survive. It mentions of a jellyfish omelet as an appetizer. Although I gotta say, I don't know if jelly and egg go together like that. I don't. Chris is saying no too. I don't. That's that's a weird one. Number one, blood pudding. Oof. This one I know that we still eat today and some cultures love it, but there's just something about the blood for me, personally. I just, I can't get over it. I, I get lightheaded thinking about blood and the taste. Well, I'd, I think I'd rather suck on an iron girder. <laughs> well, I called the chief who was a world class chef and he said, it ain't it. Roman blood pudding, or sausage, was prepared by mixing a very readily available resource of lifeblood and fat and oats to make for a very uh, loving, Tasty meal. I, oh god. Sometimes it was even put into sausage form with animal innards. Just cause, you know, go ahead, fry those, fry those bad boys up. Cook them up for me. You love the, Oh, I can't even say it, dude. It's so gross. Let's start with not consummating our marriage. In the Roman Republic, there was a custom saying that if the bride was a virgin, her husband should only sleep beside her or holding her without having intercourse for at least the first night of the marriage. The aim was to give the woman a chance to get used to the new situation, especially since marriage occurred young, and I cannot emphasize this enough, but women were raised to be very, very, very good mothers and housekeepers, but they were never actually raised to be lovers or partners. It's why so many societies in history we've seen a bunch of brothels and working girls, and a widespread acceptance of men seeking out infidelity. Their partners couldn't suit their needs because they didn't know how, but women without the job of being their wives could. Unfortunately, this very sweet just cuddle first night practice degenerated over time. Some men forced themselves on their wives. The custom disappeared thanks to the male ego, and everybody agreed on the whole intercourse during the first wedding night thing. So a newfound tradition took root. Before the consummation, maybe a day or so before the wedding or the day of, a Roman woman would have to go through the process of deflowering. In order to do that, she was taken to the Matinus Tutinus Temple on Vialia, where she would sit on the rod of Matinius Tutinus, the marriage deity. Anyways, after sitting on it, she doesn't have to do anything more than that if she does not want to. The bride-to-be was successfully deflowered, and she was able to go have intercourse with her husband later. This strange custom supposedly derives from the Romans' belief that the first penetration being with the deity would guarantee fertility and healthy children. Next up is a poisonous cocktail. It was named after the maker of the poison, Mithridates the Great, whose father had been smoked by poisoned food at a banquet. Between that and the plots his mom and bro devised against him, Mithridates began a long process of gradually administering himself incrementally larger doses of all the poisons, toxins, and venoms he could find, in hopes of slowly building up his immunity against them. The blend was known as Mithridatium. Seeing as he lived into his 80s, homeboy may have been on to something and it seems that other Roman leaders agree with me with that. The story goes that assuming that he was now invulnerable to all threats, the young king became belligerent and power drunk and in 88 BC launched an ultimately flawed campaign against the entirety of the Roman Empire and it turned into a war that lasted 25 years. Mithridates eventually loses and flees to the Armenian countryside with one of his guards. Knowing that if the Romans found him alive, his kingdom would fall, Mithridates reportedly attempts to poison himself, but he's immune. Instead, he's forced to demand his guard stab him to death. In an attempt to ensure that he could not be killed by poison, Mithridates had apparently guaranteed himself a bloody and violent death instead. Naturally, Roman emperors got a hold of this poison mix and followed suit in his path. But that's not all they're willing to consume. Next is Piss for Everything, where we see a porta potty, the Romans see dollar signs. In Rome, most of the citizenry's sewage ended up in the Cloaca Maxima, one of the world's earliest sewage systems. From here, urine was collected and thanks to its ammonia content was sold as a chemical used in laundry and tanning leather. Aside of Rome itself, full-ons, Roman dry cleaners, would visit the toilets and collect urine as well. 
cause. How did they separate the urine from the feces? Was there certain toilets for certain ones and pipes that kept them separate? Or was it all one shoot and they strained out the solid matter? In which case that would be a lot more than just pee in that liquid. But let's not go down that rabbit hole that I don't want to think about. Urine became such a big business that Emperor Vaspinian, who ruled from 69 to 79 AD, began taxing it. When his son Titus complained of the disgusting way his father was making coin, Vespinian told his son to smell a gold coin. Then he asked him if it stank. When his son replied that it didn't, the emperor replied, yet it comes from urine. Oh, call that dirty money you just got own, son. Even Emperor Nero passed a urine tax, which everyone had to pay if they want to use a public bathroom. So what else are they using it for? Mouthwash for whitening your teeth, growing juicy fruits like pomegranates and citrus, washing their togas, curing diseased animals, fertilizing lands, tanning leather, or their own skin. No shortage of piss potential in Rome. And speaking of bathrooms, the ancient Romans took explosive diarrhea to a whole new level with blowing up the bowl. Almost every city in ancient Rome had large public latrines, let alone any of average size or small size. In the Forum of Julius Caesar, for example, archaeologists discovered a latrine with 50 toilets. Like other latrines in ancient Rome, Caesars had heated floors. In general, many had marble paneling, mosaics on the floor, and even decorative statues. Yet when you enter a Roman toilet, this social and cultural hub of conversation and laughter and strained faces, there was a very real risk you would die. The first problem was creatures living in the sewage system, snakes, scorpions, octopuses, and clawing rats, which would claw up and just bite or whack people on the ass while they did their business. Worse than that though, unlike today where we flush and walk away, they had to fear the methane buildup, which sometimes got so bad that it would ignite and explode under you. Sitting and doing your thing one moment turned to paste, obliterated against a stone wall the next. Toilets became so dangerous that people resorted to magic to stay alive, written spells meant to keep toilet demons at bay, were found on the walls of bathrooms. Some though came pre-equipped with statues of Fortuna, the goddess of luck, to guard them. And many of these good luck charms were the Ficinius. Pant snake, elusive sausage, a Jimmy, a Peter, you get my point. These bad boys, big, small, uncut, or cut, were seen everywhere. Hung in doorways, made into sun catchers or wind chimes, candles, jewelry, just about anywhere the Romans could slap a peewee, they did it, and they believed it to ward off evil spirits and the evil eye. Obviously, they didn't share our modern skittishness towards the male member, let alone nudity. It was fairly common to see the everyday Roman man walk around with a copper dong on his necklace, seeing as they were believed to prevent harm from coming to people who wore them. Good luck peni were also drawn on safe places to keep travelers safe. Sharp curves and rickety bridges in Rome often had dongs drawn on them to grant good luck to every passerby. The volcanic eruption that buried Pompeii left it wonderfully preserved for archaeologists, who when they got their first look at it, found things that were so obscene they hit them from the public view for over a hundred years. Pompeii was filled with art that was so filthy it was like a physicalized prehistoric Brazzers.com. To this day you can walk through Pompeii and see a site that Romans would have enjoyed every day. Dinglings carved into the road, with the tips sometimes emitting a droplet, pointing the way to the nearest brothel. In ancient Rome it wasn't your everyday Italian cuisine, it was more like boiled bird and brains. When one thinks of Italian food we usually already aren't thinking correctly. Pizza was never made by them, the pasta most of us eat is it totally incorrectly made, and we're drinking cappuccino wrong. But you definitely wouldn't guess things like fried dormice or flamingo, peacock and nightingale tongues, lamb brain, sow's womb, and more. For flamingo and parrot in Fonio Cotero, a dish I can't pronounce, you would scald the flamingo, wash it and dress it, put it in a pot, add water, salt, dill, and a little vinegar to be parboiled. Finish cooking with a bunch of leeks and coriander and add some reduced must to give it color. No idea what that is. In the mortar, crush pepper, cumin, coriander, laser root, mint, rue, moisten with vinegar, add date, and the fond of braised bird, thicken, strain over, and cover the bird with the sauce and serve. Parrot is prepared in the same manner. Anything toddlers or grown North Americans would dislike from an animal was the favorite of the Romans. Many ancient Roman dishes are now famous in other countries, such as haggis, the national dish of Scotland, and foie gras, which the French have perfected. That's because the Roman Empire was vast, and when they conquered other countries, they brought snacks. Fun fact, if you had dinner and were invited guest and brought along somebody who wasn't necessarily invited, this person was called a shadow or a pig.
parasite and would sit at your foot the whole meal. They were expected to bring witty banter and conversation to help compensate for their free meal. On the topic of weird eats, how about a celebrity diet? Gladiators, godly men of battle arena who were revered in the heat and ignored in the streets. But no matter how lowly the status, something about that battler's blood was desirable. Several Roman authors report people gathering the blood of dead gladiators and selling it as medicine. Strangely, some Roman physicians actually report that this treatment worked. They claim to have seen people who drank human blood recover from their epilepsy fits, and that was just the civilized approach. Others would pull out the gladiator's livers and eat them raw right there in the arena after he dropped. When gladiator combat was outlawed in 400 AD, people kept the treatment going by drinking the blood of decapitated prisoners. So while the gladiators who lost became medicine for epileptics, the winners became aphrodisiac. In Roman times, soap was hard to come by, so athletes cleaned themselves by covering their bodies in oil and scraping the dead skin cells off with a tool called stragil. I'll teach you more about that. Usually the dead skin cells were just discarded, but not if you're a gladiator. Their skin and sweat scrapings were often put in a bottle and sold. Often this was worked into facial creams that women would then rub all over themselves, hoping the dead skin cells of a gladiator would make them irresistible to men. And there's no way I wasn't going to talk about it on its own, scraping off the layers. The grooming habits of ancient Romans were strange mix of activities that we might recognize from our modern lives, and routines that are completely foreign to us. For example, this tool called a stragil, which resembles more of a horse this hoof pick than a human grooming tool was used by the Romans and the Greeks of ancient world to scrape sweat and dirt from the body. People who engaged in strenuous physical activity were prone to accumulating large amounts of sweat and dirt and were most likely to have this item in their possession. And it was most likely to be used to clean the skin before bathing so as to not muck up the water more than necessary. Some would lather up in olive oil to help the scraping process. If you're no gladiator that olive oil isn't going to be funneled back into a jar to sell but rather Rather for someone else to lather up in and use to scrape later. Ha, <laughs> public bathhouse luxury. Next up are the burial clubs, because death was an integral part of life for the Romans. Why not make a club, cult, whatever for this too, like they did for literally everything else. From the creation of Rome until about mid second century AD, cremation was the most common burial rite, after which the preferred method was actual ground burials. Shockingly, having your body baked was cheaper than a fancy box in the ground, so when Cremation went out of style, Rome's poorest were often tossed into pits called puticuli, meaning to rot or decompose. These pits held a mixture of human remains, animal corpses, garbage, and excrement. Some of them were large, containing 24,000 corpses each, and they'd be left open until full enough. This wasn't the best way to be buried, so anyone who could afford it would join a burial club. A burial club was a group that charged monthly dues of 100 sequestries and a jar of wine for new members. And when one of the members died, you would all pool the clubs money together to bury that member. Some of these clubs had mixed membership of serfs, unfreed, and freed people. If someone took their own life, however, it was considered a forfeit right to a funeral. In addition to burying any dead members, the other main activity of the club was to hold a series of feasts every other month to honor their dead. Some of the dues were used to fund those feasts, and each one, several members, were responsible for providing a certain minimum amount of food for the sad potluck. Imagine that. Thea, I know you're still mourning patricolis, but don't forget it's your week to bring in potluck figs and olive salad. Seriously. And of course, what completes a funeral more than a weirdly perfect replica of the dead person's face staring at you? It's death mask. The Romans celebrated the life and accomplishments of prominent men with marble busts, dedications of buildings, and grand tombs. One rather obscure crafted memorial overlooked because the artifacts have not withstood the test of time are Roman death masks, or as they're commonly referred to in Latin, imagines. Made of wax, they they were unquestionably created when the man was in between 35 and 40, and that's when he had attained political office or ADL of city clerk. The new mask would join the older ones in the atrium cover where it would remain for display until that person's death. The date at which the masks were first introduced is difficult to determine, but they were already well established by the 2nd century BC, and they continued to be used into the 4th and perhaps as late as the 6th. The masks were then kept in the family throughout the generations and often displayed in the main halls of the house. At a funeral procession, the masks of the ancestors were worn by current family members as a way of preserving their memory. Polybius describes the funeral of an illustrious man and the role of his amigines. When any distinguished member of the family dies, they take the death mask to the funeral, putting them on men who seem to bear the closest resemblance to the original in stature and carriage. Penn Museum worked with four graduates to, and a career sculptor to recreate these masks as you can see on screen. The group used only the tools and materials accessible to those 
in ancient Rome, and the mask came out really, really well. So quite literally, like the opening scene in the campy Paris 2004's House of Wax, the Romans were making wax faces.